Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. What is most essential to live out the Christian life? The pattern of life that we've been taught to live has been described back in chapter 12. Because of the mercies of God, we are to live self-sacrificially. We are to live holy lives. We are to live in true worship before God. We are to live in a life or a mind changing, a mind renewed sort of progress, not conforming to the world, but being transformed, being changed by the renewal of our minds. If we are to ask what properly motivates all these things, how are these things properly carried out? I think that we'd have to come finally to the motivation, to the undergirding of love. Self-sacrifice, self I think, in the end is impossible apart from love. Are we going to sacrifice what we hold dear if we don't love God? Well, the same thing goes with how we relate to others. Are we going to submit ourselves or esteem others better than ourselves? as we've been called to do? Are we going to not revile when others revile us, as we've been called to do in chapter 12? When people persecute us, do we respond in like manner or do we respond the way that we're called to? I think love is the motivating factor that guides the Christian life. It's the emotive factor as, as well. It's the reason we will live the Christian life out. Today, that's our great theme, is love. This is no small theme. It's no easy topic to concern ourselves with. It's much easier, in fact, to come to Scripture and say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, than it is to say, love first God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and then love your neighbor as yourself. But we come to this text because this is where the text brings us to. These verses, verses 8 through 10, concern loving not just those within the family of God. If you go back to chapter 12, you'll see in verse 9 that we are to let love be genuine. And, and he's speaking there to the church in regard to love that we have for one another especially. He says, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Love one another, there has to do with kindred love, we learned. This is speaking of our love we have among ourselves, within the body. And then we get to chapter 13 and we already considered what he had to say about our relationship to government and government's relationship to God as God giving it authority and our submission to government. Now we see how we ought to relate to others, not of the body of Christ necessarily, but all others. The first point this morning, as we see in verse 8, is the debt of love we owe to everyone or to all. He says, owe no one anything. And he uses this word, we translate owe, as a segue from verse 7. We owe taxes because the government rulers or those who work in government are God's servants. Fulfilling their office in that way, they need money to do so. And so we owe taxes. Here, 
We are said to no one, owe no one anything. And so there's a connection here. Otherwise, there's not much of a connection between government, our responsibility to it, and what comes after. But Paul is connecting them here. And it, of course, it connects from what we saw in Romans chapter 12, at the end of Romans chapter 12, from verse 9 onward. But he says, no one, owe no one anything. He's not here indicting us for borrowing or for lending. Scripture is very clear. In fact, tonight, Psalm 37, he says the righteous lend freely. That's one of the aspects of the righteous, is that we will have in order to lend, that we will be those who lend to others. Scripture doesn't condemn borrowing or lending outright. He's meaning here something as regarding our ongoing responsibility, our ongoing debt. He's saying we should not have any open, unpaid or unpaying, that is we're not committing ourselves to the agreement of paying our debts. That's what he means by owe here. These are unpaid debts, except he says to love one another. And he's teaching us here that love towards each other then is a duty. It's not optional. It's not something that we can take or leave when we get up on any particular morning. We as believers are being taught here by the authority of God that love is an ongoing necessity in fulfilling what he says here, the law. That is the will of God. That is, if you will do the will of God, you will love. And it will not be that you just got up yesterday and you decided, hey, I'm going to love my wife or I'm going to love my neighbor today. That's the subject, the neighborly love. I'm going to love them today, but tomorrow, I've done it yesterday now, so now today, I don't have that duty. This is an ongoing responsibility. It's an ongoing debt, if you will. We will never discharge or never full, fully pay this duty out in this life. It's ongoing. It's continuing. But you have to come to matters like this. And sometimes you ask the question, why do we have to love everyone? You see, this is one of the things that our secular world takes for granted. We can come to Scripture and we can assume God's authority underneath this, right? That we should. We should come to Scripture and when we ask that question, why, we can see, well, God tells us to do so. But the why is not there apart from an answer. Do you, that's a weird way to say that. It's not just intrinsically there. When the world asks the question, or when they tell each other, without the authority of God, you should love me, they might say, because we're all human. And I would say that's an insufficient answer. <laughs> that's an insufficient answer answer to say why we should all love each other. You look in nature, if we're just all a part of nature, all sorts of natural animals and creatures don't treat each other with love. <laughs> they don't. So, so what makes us different from that animal over there? And you'll have all sorts of natural arguments that say, we're no different. We're just an advanced feature of those animals over there. There is no real answer, in other words, to this question of why should we all love one another outside of Scripture. This is a remarkable command. You understand that. In the history of the world, not every civilization was telling their people, love one another and so ful fulfill moral righteousness or the will of God. Love one another. Paul is saying here more than that. He's saying it's the essence of moral righteousness. Why? 
Well, we can come from scripture and we can say, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. We can see there's a way that God loves us that bears responsibility about the way that we love others. God loves his creatures. I believe God loves in a degree, he loves all of his creatures. I believe he loves his creatures in varying degrees. He loves his bride in a unique way. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love all he made in his image in a particular way. He shows grace, common grace, even to the unregenerate, to the wicked. He sends rain, and that can be a means of judgment, and it all can, also can be a means of showing his mercy, which we see is a component of love. We'll see that today. But we know by the character of God that we, by that character, ought to love one another. We know that while we were enemies of God, he loved us and gave his son for us. And so we're taught, love your enemies. We can come to that question, why do we love at all? And we can say, not only are we to love at all based on the authority of scripture and God's word, we can say God has demonstrated why we love this way, why we ought to love this way, because he has loved this way. The last phrase of verse eight and verses nine and 10 inform us of the weight and the importance of love, doesn't it? Listen to what he says about it. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. This describes, this is Paul's way of describing how important love is. Fulfilled the law? That's a massive, weighty virtue. You could say you could fulfill the law of God it's showing how important love is when he says that. The one who loves another has fulfilled the law. He means more than just that, but that's underneath it. He's describing the moral weight of love. Here we also need to ask a few questions because of what's come before this in Romans. Why if Paul has taught that we are no longer under the law, does he use law as a moral weight to show the value of love. Why does he do that? You go back to chapter six, please. Go back to Romans 6, 14 and 15. He says, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Twice there, verses 14 and 15, he says we are not under law. Chapter 7, one chapter forward, verses 4 through 6. Likewise, my brothers, this is what he says here. You also have died to the law through the body of Christ. This regards the law covenant so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in our flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in a new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. In verse, chapter eight, verses three and four, kind of spin off on that. For it says, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now I don't have time to go through and exegete all of those but it's clear from these texts. Three things are very clear. First, the law as a covenant has been annulled and replaced by the new covenant in Christ. Once we trust the gospel, once we're trusting, putting our faith in Christ, we are united to Christ and positioned firmly in a new covenant. And the old covenant, that old marriage covenant is done because it has ceased to be, it has died, as, as, as Paul says in 
Romans 7. Subsequently, those components that were particular to it, the mosaic components, are annulled by Christ in the new promises, the new uh, uh, benefits that come through Christ in the new covenant. Secondly, God's grace through Christ, not the law. Listen, this is important. God's grace through Christ, not the law, gives us the capacity to enable us to live righteously. The law gives no ability to live righteously, is what Paul is saying in chapter 7. That's one of the great purposes. Even in chapter 8 there, the law cannot induce us to doing good. There's no power in it to enable us to do righteously. But God's grace through Christ enables us to do what is right. And that's picked up again there in chapter 8. And that's the third point. Christ in his suffering, in his suffering, he fulfilled what our debt was in accordance with the law, the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf. And he provides for us on the other end, the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying influence of the Holy Spirit. That's the grace of God working and the Spirit of Christ in us. And so now we walk by the Spirit. Our minds are influenced by the Spirit. And we can do what God requires of us. By grace, not by the law, but by grace. So in those three ways, we see the law being annulled, removed. Why then does Paul use here then the law to demonstrate the importance of of living our ongoing, living out our ongoing duty of love. He's using the law as an as a element of value. Why if it's fulfilled? Why if it's annulled? First, the law, he never says the law loses its moral value, its weightiness, morally speaking. In fact, he says in chapter 7, verse 12, the law is holy. It is currently holy, is what he says. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. He says that there are three different ways. Paul, in all of the New Testament, is careful to distinguish, to distinguish the moral righteousness of the law, listen, and at the same time, its inability to save or sanctify any of us. At the same time, it's moral, it's righteous, it's good, and it has no ability to save anyone. Secondly, the law in the new covenant has been promised to us as a benefit that comes along with Christ. Jeremiah 31, 33 says this, This is the covenant that I will make with them, with the house of Israel, for after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. Well, that's incredible when it comes to this idea of fulfillment, the value of the law. Again here, the law cannot be understood then as not being valuable or being weighty or being important for us. It's part of the blessings that come in the new covenant. And I will write it on their hearts. That is, the law of God will be written on our hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. He's saying you will delight to do it, the law of God. And that's fulfilled. We know that's fulfilled for us. Hebrews 8, 6. Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. The law written on our hearts is one of those better promises. It's no longer do this and you shall live. It's Christ did this. Now he's doing this work in you because you are trusting in him. He's the mediator between God and man. He's already made our path straight between God and us, sinful though we are. And now not only does he do that, but he enables us. He gives us the gracious influence that our hearts desire after God to do his will. That's one of the promises. It's one of the things we should expect in the new covenant. 
And so Paul says in Romans 7.22, speaking about what I believe is his experience as a believer, I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Not as a means of salvation, but as a moral righteousness of action. I want to obey God. I love, the psalmist says, the law of God. And then he says in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what's given him that desire. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. This is that same mind that's being renewed in chapter 12 too. The third answer is this, to why does he use the law to demonstrate the importance of living in love towards our neighbor? The third is this, the specific aspect of the law which Paul describes in our text I believe is a particular, particularly valuable component of what we see that was given to Israel, but that pertains to all men and women, all people, everywhere and all times, namely the Ten Commandments. I believe, and this is a theological assertion, and I don't have time to defend it here this morning, but I, I preached on this. You can go on our website if you want to listen to my my view on this. I believe the Ten Commandments precede Moses in their essential moral nature and character. I don't believe there was ever a time since God created the world when it was okay to worship something other than God or to take his name in vain or to even fail to rest as God demonstrated us that we ought to rest to disobey your parents, to dishonor them, to lie and steal and bear false witness and murder and covet and commit adultery. All of those things precede, in fact, we can see that in scripture, they precede the giving of the law. And what does Paul reference here when he specifically references the law? He references the Decalogue, specifically the, the second table of the Ten Commandments. And we'll look at that a little bit here. But secondly, the relationship of law and love. The relationship of law and love. Verses 10 and 9 and 10. For the commandments, that's from the Ten Commandments. Here we go. The seventh, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. The sixth, you shall not steal. The eighth, you shall not covet. We don't know why specifically Paul arranges these in this way. We do know that there are some ancient documents copy of the Septuagint and other things that have this arrangement. It doesn't seem to be on purpose for any reason in the text. But the point is, is he's describing these moral laws, these commands of God. And any other commandment, he says, are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Paul's, first of all, his teaching here accords with our Lord's, doesn't it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first command. And the second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets, Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Loving our neighbor is concerned with what is called, as I mentioned, the second table of the law. What do I mean by the second table of the law? In the, in the Ten Commandments, usually the first four, sometimes the first five, are put as our relationship to God. That's defining how we relate to God as his creatures. We don't create idols. We worship only him. We don't take his name in vain. We rest as God rested, right? And, and sometimes the fifth is included in that first table. Sometimes it's included in the second table. But what does the second table have to do? Our responsibility towards our neighbor. So loving God first, loving our neighbor. The law, the Ten Commandments, concern both of those aspects that Paul, or that Paul and Jesus says here is fulfilled in love. Now he says only four commandments here. Some regard that the fifth commandment regarding authority, parental authority, also has to do with government authority, which Paul just spoke about in verses 1 through 7, didn't he? And then he, he leaves off bearing false witness here. But he does say this phrase, or any other commandment, doesn't he? 
So Paul is being pithy here. He's, he's being pithy, he's being uh, general, but he's being clear at the same time. One cannot fulfill the law in the sense of living righteously before God apart from love is his point. And some might object, and they, they might say, I believe that Paul is saying fulfilling the law is love's responsibility, not the actual commandment. He's not concerned with us actually concerning ourselves with the commandments. He's just concerned with love here, right? Because love is the fulfillment of these things. So we don't really need to focus on the commandments themselves. Those are just written codes. And I would say, I think that misses the mark. What are you to do when you love your neighbor? That is a big, important question. In today's subjective world, we will make up anything as fulfilling this, love your neighbor. In the last year or so, with COVID-19, we have been so bold so as to say one particular policy, governmental policy, will define you following that, the CDC says so, therefore that is how you love your neighbor. And you create a wax nose out of love that way. You love your neighbor if you don't go to work. That's what they said. Beloved, you may love your neighbor because you must go to work. You see how subjective things can get with this issue. We, we need to be very careful about subjectifying something that God doesn't merely put in the subjective realm. This is one way I like to uh, put this in your mind, this analogy. When you go into the bypass and you're coming from Kapaa and you got the coconut marketplace line behind you, right? You got that lineup of cars and then you have the bypass coming in, right? And you think, look how loving I am. I'm in the marketplace line, the coconut marketplace line. I'm going to let five cars move in off the bypass. Look how loving I am. I love my neighbor. I love five of my neighbors as myself. And I just want to remind you that you have a line of cars behind you. <laughs> you see how subjectivizing things doesn't always answer what true love is? Here's my conviction. Paul uses the second table of the Ten Commandments in a, in, a, in a weighty way to show the value of love and to show the value of how love lives out itself. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to commit sexual sins, adultery. If you love your neighbor, here's... Here's one way we subjectify love, isn't it? I know how much my, my neighbor loves his wife, so I committed adultery with her. I knew that would make her happy. Can you imagine? That's something that you could hear today. I'm not saying that's good. I'm saying that's one way that I could hear our subjective world describing what love is in a perverted and sinful way. No, Paul is defining, in a sense, how love is lived out. As I say it, the Ten Commandments exegete what true love is. And so there's a relationship. There's a relationship between the law and love here. Paul calls, or James calls it the perfect law of liberty to love your neighbor. It's liberty because of what God has done in us. Undefined love is subjective love. That's not what Paul is doing here. Love and obedience to these commands coincides with loving our neighbor as ourselves. And here's a question. Can these commandments be obeyed without love? And for that, Philippians 3, 6 is very interesting. Paul is describing himself pre-conversion as a Pharisee, as an Israel of Israelites. I mean, he's a Benjaminite. He is the, the real deal. And listen to what he says of himself. 
He says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Really? What does he mean by blameless there? Because we read in 1 Timothy 1.13, we read this about Paul, describing again his unconverted condition. Though former, formerly, listen to what he says about himself, formerly I was a blasphemer. That's the first table of the law he failed. Persecutor and insolent. That's the second table of the law he failed. He was an insolent opponent to God and to his church. So his confession in 1 Timothy 1.13 makes it clear that Paul means something very cultural, very culturally Jewish, if you will, when he says he was blameless under the law. Outwardly speaking, he conformed to every aspect of the law and the tradition of the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But what Paul admits in 1 Timothy is that I wasn't fulfilling it at all. Because inwardly, my heart was not for God. I did not express inwardly the same thing I was doing outwardly. His confession in 1.13 makes it clear that he was not in the sense of blameless, in the sense of fulfilling the law, because he did not love God. He did not love his neighbor. And Jesus makes it very clear as well in the Sermon on the Mount that the motives matter. It's not just that you don't murder. Do you hate somebody in your heart? Do you hate your brother in your heart? It's not merely that you don't commit adultery, the act. Do you lust over your neighbor's wife? It's not just that you don't commit some atrocious act of violence or theft or bear false witness, the way that you think in your heart is what Jesus says, so are you. How a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You're not moral just because you do the deed. Motivation matters, emotives matter. First Corinthians 13 is aimed directly at the self-righteous deceiver who thinks that merely by conforming to outward graces or gifts or virtues, you are doing the will of God. And he says, even in mercy, even in acts of mercy, if we don't have love, we are nothing. You could do all of these things or not do all of these things and fail to fulfill the weight of them, the righteousness of them. Another question comes up, can we love our neighbors while disobeying the commandments? Now, even in a corrupt society like ours, the, the question should be obvious, the answer should be obvious. You cannot love your neighbor and steal his goods at the same time. You cannot love your neighbor and lie, bear false witness, slander him, gossip about him or her. You cannot love your neighbor and covet his things. So it's to envy or have greed in your heart to take what he has. All of these things are very obvious, but they are so debated even within the church. You know, there's, there's good scholars that will come to this text and they will say, we have no responsibility towards these Ten Commandments. They're good scholars that say even those things because they are, they are impressed by the concern of fulfillment. But here's how we should see fulfillment. We should see that fulfillment when it comes to doing the Ten Commandments is first of all fulfilled in Christ. So that means the guilt and shame of failing, which we'll do every day, will never love God and you'll never love your neighbor perfectly, not one day of your life. But that guilt and that shame is taken away. But the motivation to love, the desire to love, God has put that within us so that we will live towards our neighbor in this way. Verse 10 says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment 
fulfilling of the law. What would society look like where people followed this commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself? You can go back to Leviticus, the Old Testament. Levit Leviticus 19, 9 through 18. I, wanna, I want you to see the kind of society that God ordained Israel to live, uh, to live like. What, what he ordained that they would look like. And then see why they would look like this. And just ask yourself, would our society be better off or worse off if we obeyed God and it looked like this? Look at this. Verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Now, this is a pattern that pertains to doing mercy. But there's also another aspect. There's the effort involved of those who need that they can go out and glean. There's two aspects of that. There's mercy and then there's work. That's good for a society. Mercy and work. Christ taught us that mercy pertains to this commandment of loving our neighbors as ourself. In Luke 10, 30 through 36, he gave the parable of the Good Samaritan, didn't he? These terminal enemies, these greatest enemies of their day. You have the priest, you have the rabbi, they, they walk on the other side of the road of their own Jewish man who was beaten, left for dead. They pass by on the other side of the road. And you see a Samaritan who's the enemy. And he comes and he shows mercy. And Jesus says to his disciples after in verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. You see, that's prescribed back here in Leviticus. And Jesus is not necessarily teaching something new, but he's enlightening the hearts of not only his disciples, but ours as well. Loving your neighbor means loving even your enemy. Be merciful. And Jesus said to them, or to him, to this man, you go and do likewise. And then we see honesty and equity in the dealings of Israel if they would have obeyed this commandment. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. Verse 11, back in Leviticus 19. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely so as to mislead. And so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you at all, you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. We would not subvert justice because of a lust of power if we would obey this commandment. You shall do no injustice in court, verse 15. You shall not be partial to the poor or deaf or to defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. We would not slander, we would not hate and do violence to our neighbor if we would obey this commandment. You shall not go around, in verse 16, as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. Listen why. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see, love your neighbor means all of those other things will be done. That's the stress of the teaching. And that's the fulfillment of the law. Now here's the last, last application. Once again, once again, the ability, our willingness to do this comes because of the mercies of God. Chapter 12, verse 1, by the mercies of God. You see, the motivation, the desire of our heart, the willingness to do this, you know what this means? It means self-sacrifice. It, it does mean that, to love our neighbor. What did it cost the Samaritan man to love his neighbor? What was he doing that day on the road to Jericho that he had to stop and help somebody on the side of the road, pay 
his own money to have him cared for. It costs to love this way. And the way that we'll love this way as believers, the way that we will commit ourselves to this sort of life is to first to see that love was shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not, yeah, the, I, the idea of altruism is a very tricky moral issue in my, the, the idea of altruism is this uh, Kantian ethic, just do it because it's right. But the question of rightness and wrongness is at hand. Do it because God has done it for you. Do it because he, your God, your Lord, has not only done it for you, he's told you that it is good. And if he is our Lord, if Christ is our Savior, it will be our delight to do his will. That's how we love. We need to get back to loving this way. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you would help us here.